All right, it looks like we are live. Um, thank you so much for all of your presentations. And I'd like to start with some of the questions that came from the audience. The first one was um, for Daniel, will digital therapeutics be under prescription to differentiate them from other non-science based apps in the store? It's not, it's, it is gonna be, it's already a reality. I mean, there's already one one first case in the in the US uh, with Achille uh, doing uh, solutions uh, uh, to HDHD and other pathologies. So they already got uh, approval uh, for their for their for their platform mm -hmm. for for uh, at least for one condition. So, but you need to think on on digital therapeutics to differentiate from from rehab that we are working on neuro restoration. As a neuro restoration, it needs to be treated as a, as a medicine, so not not just a, as a tool uh, to do rehabilitation. So, and this path is not even well defined in in many countries. So, in 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 that sense, I think US is a bit advanced compared to Europe. So, but uh, we are trying to to push uh, together with other uh, colleagues. So, these these boundaries. Thank you so much. And then for um, Christy, will um, how early can you detect the disease before conversion? Yeah, so we're working on that question right now. Um, all of our work to date has been on already diagnosed individuals, so differentiating diagnosed from controls. And so as we begin to collect more longitudinal data, that can help us to shift and learn more about the disease and, and move earlier on. So for the use case of multiple sclerosis, what we're looking for there is really disease monitoring. So we wanna do post, post diagnosis. For Alzheimer's and mild cognitive impairment, we wanna do early detection. So for that particular use case, we will want to be able to, to answer that exact question and we're working on it now. Thank you so much. And now a little bit more um, general. So, I think with these technologies, you have a massive advantage to earlier um, when we did paper pencil and things are validated just in a certain group and they were very biased for like age, uh, for education and, and, and different um, cultures and, and also like biased by language. And so I'm curious in terms of scalability, um, what's the perfect market for you and um, how do you see it scale also in kind of lower resource settings where um, people might not have necessarily Wi-Fi or access to a doctor? Um, how do you how do you see the path for your company going there? Start with uh, with Daniel. Yeah. So in terms of scalability, I mean, I think the the use that the, our clients they have been using uh, for mind motion they already speak for itself. So we originally uh, developed the tool for for acquired brain injury, mainly stroke, but also traumatic. But you see that clinicians, they, they find it useful for uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, Parkinson's diseases, on, on other conditions. And you know, that help us also to get you know, validated data for other conditions. But uh, you know, it, it's not initiated by us, it's really initiated by the clinicians so that they really find it useful. So I think most of the you know, motor and, and, and cognitive deficits, is, they are more or less shared across uh, pathologies, etiologies. So I think it's a very good, you know, it can be scalable, very, very easy. Thank you so much. How about you, Victoria? So I guess in the in the case of Enhance and the tools that we develop virtually, we we do expect to. We hope that the the fact that first of all, like the games that we are designing and the tasks that we are envisioning for our future are um, hopefully culture independent. They are supposed to be closer to games that hopefully will be independent of culture of training. Also, we are hoping that uh, our tool can be as clinician or caretaker or examiner independent as possible, but making it easy to interactive and easy to understand and uh, hopefully hopefully very straightforward for the users and the patients so hope and we're working on many tools of being able to remote control them even if the patients are do not have direct access to going to wherever they are doing the training that simply it's a, a connection between them two then this doesn't go on very well with what you were suggesting with low wi-fi or low access to the internet but mm -hmm. um, 
there and we, we could work on ways working around our solution is also very easily translatable so we hope to be able to scale it in as many languages and as many countries as possible in that sense so hopefully as yes, it can be very scalable brilliant and uh christy yeah so using the eye is a great way to assess things non-invasively and quickly so a lot of the work that we've been doing first starting off in multiple sclerosis We've heard from clinicians and from patients that the MRIs just aren't providing them the granular information that they need. And so for MRIs, which are millions of dollars to buy, extremely expensive to run and to have technicians to be there to man all of those, um, this provides a much lower cost solution. So by being able to do a 10 second scan as opposed to a 45 minute long MRI, that can really reach a lot more people. And so for individuals and groups that typically have to drive two or three hours to get to a, a station with an MRI, our eye tracking device is much more easily deployable. Um, we've also had uh, some suggestions from investors and other board members, you know, the way that you go to CVS or Walgreens here in the US to get your blood pressure measured through that cuff, um, why not get your eye measured there as well? So there are thoughts about how to potentially make that broader use for, for the greater population. But I think the first big step is, is being able to not necessarily replace MRI, but hopefully to use eye motion as a flagging mechanism for MRI or for um, an alternative for those who just don't have access. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And then we have a question by Arzu for um, Victoria. The transfer effect of cognitive training is rather debated in the literature. Do we have evidence that VR is different or is that um, still a hypothesis at this stage? So I'm, I'm very happy for this question. So thank you for asking it. So of course, uh, it, it, is, it is very debated in the literature, the effects of cognitive training, but it's true that uh, once you put this, the, any training in VR, it's it becomes way more close to the actual task or the way you would act in your daily life. It allows to have a lot of controlled variables. So it does have this potential that that needs to be tested, of course. And for Enhance, we do still lack the evidence that our cognitive training solution is providing this transferability, but it's also in our pipeline to do the proper research to make sure that it, this goes beyond a hypothesis and we can see if virtual reality training and for, in this case using our solution can provide transferability to, acti uh, to activities of daily living or to uh, overall uh, performance in daily activities outside the VR environment and outside the train tasks. But we do believe that given the inherent characteristics of VR, it has a potential to do so. Thank you so much. And then Arza had another question for Christy as well. Um, the AMS example that you gave was impressive. You mentioned also MCI. Um, do you know, at least from uh, other people's work, what the success rate is with, with MCI or Alzheimer's disease, or maybe even subjective cognitive decline? Yeah, so with MCI, our study just started at UCSF. Um, so we've only seen six individuals through our device. We have that baseline of healthy controls to compare to, but we've only seen six. So for the answer I'll give, it'll be based on previous literature. So there is a group, um, Susana Martinez-Conde and Jorge Otero Milan, those two individuals in the literature have shown in Alzheimer's, in diagnosed Alzheimer's, that fixational eye motion changes can be seen between patients and controls. So particularly in those papers, they showed a directionality change in the way that the eye moves comparing the two groups. So there has been studies on fixational eye motion in AD. And so it's our hope that by providing a much more sensitive eye tracking device that we can move earlier on in the process to see some changes at that earlier stage. So the answer is yes for AD for sure in the literature in fixation. And our hope is that we can expand that to the MCI space. Thank you so much. And uh, speaking of healthy aging um, that you mentioned before, and, and Daniel also got um, at that a little bit. So the difference between, we need to know what healthy aging looks like for us to be able to understand what the disease is. Mm -hmm. um, Daniel, how is that, how do you address that with your tool, like the, the training for healthy aging versus kind of unhealthy aging? Yeah, so basically in our trial, we have uh, two the groups. One was uh, robust, 
seniors, really no cognitive, no physical issue, not risk of fall. And another group with a pre-frail, so this this frailty scale, and we were having just pre-frail. We were, we didn't want to have really diagnosed I mean, people who were already uh, that already had a di diagnostic there, but really uh, healthy, but at the risk of, you no, know, uh, having MCI or, or or risk of fall. So and then what we have now we are analyzing the results of the clinical trial that that finished in last August. And we see that the group that they really benefit from, from the cognitive training is the pre -frame. So those that are already active and, and really healthy, they, they, they maintain the status, but those that are already, you know, they already started showing some signs of decline, they're able to even, you know, come back to the, to the baseline as, as the robust. So we see that, you know, early intervention, the earlier, the better, so MC, even before MCI, mild cognitive impairment, it's worth uh, you know, start a, a, I mean, not treatment, but the, to continue the training. Basically, it's just a, you know, brain for fit. So uh, we, are, we are in the prevention. So we are not in the, in the rehab uh, status. So uh, it's something that we need to continue. Even at that age, it's, it's also um, effective. And then this is mostly for the VR um, technologies uh, and interventions. How do you ensure um, adherence? How do you engage your participants over longer periods of time? And, and do you think maybe we heard before about um, techn techniques to disengage from unhealthy behavior? Could there be something that we could take and turn around there and actually engage people in certain behaviors uh, and get them kind of addicted to brain games? Oh, that's a, that's an interesting <laughs> question. Thank you. So, to um, the way that we're trying to maximize adherence and engagement is to making sure that the games that we have are interesting and fun to play. So, also because having this type of of gamified experience, we hope that will also take away from the idea that the people are being tested or trained or so uh, that. For now, these are the strategies we ensure in terms of uh, in, in clinical settings to make sure that we don't have patient dropout. We still haven't encountered a lot of these problems, so we, we want to make adjustments as we find these issues. Uh, but we hope that given how uh, we've put a lot of thought into making these experiences fun and engaging, and especially they are very short, so the games last between one minute and three minutes, depending on the, on the game, we hope that these uh, these characteristics will help maintain a stable period of um, adherence. And in the meantime, sorry, I forgot about your second question. See so if you would, wouldn't mind repeating it. We can use some of the techniques we've learned to disengage from unhealthy behavior to, to engage people into healthy behaviors. Yes, and, um, and it's very interesting that you're bringing this up because we are also working on uh, some uh, come, uh, some cognitive bias modification uh, ex experiences that are under development right now. So it's very interesting. We want to also use leverage uh, VR to create scenarios that also are more resembling to, for example, run away from alcohol addiction, for example, and try to engage people towards more healthy behaviors while uh, escaping from these uh, uh, alcohol driven behaviors, for example. Victoria, and then maybe Daniel, a quick answer, um, and then we'll have to hop over to the the um, final session. Yeah. So in our specific case for uh, motor deficits, uh, one thing that uh, we do with our motion tracking is that we are able to detect uh, compensation movements. So people, uh, you know, do uh, compensate with the movements as because they have a deficit, they try to compensate somehow, and this is uh, kind of unhealthy. So the that's where the technology can help us in in detecting such a movement, so the user can correct them. Thank you so much to um, all of our speakers. I could keep um, talking to you for hours <laughs> and I'd love to, but I'm uh, handing over to Bogdan now and I'll see you shortly. Thank you so much uh, for your time for contributions. Um, thanks. Thank all. you so much for having us. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Bye.